Here in the book of Matthew, look at verse number, chapter 12, verse number 24. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Now I want you to keep your Bibles open tonight. I'm going to give you a Bible message on the subject of demons. I announced it uh, this morning that I'd be doing this. It's very, it's very, very serious. It's not a joke. It's not something just, uh, you know, to be a, have a sensational topic to sell videos or something like that. It's a Bible teaching. It is a Bible truth, and uh, it would help us as Christians to realize what we're up against. And I know we're living in a time when a belief, an actual belief in demonic spirits is diminishing in churches, but it's growing out in the world, that's for sure. Only they don't call them demons out in the world. They call them higher powers, masters, guider, guiding spirits, light, you know, um, creatures from outer space, and no telling what. But the Bible said there's devils. And here in Matthew 12, there is a, you know, there is one devil, the big devil, and there are many devils, plural. Look at verse number uh, 24, Matthew 12. But the Pharisees heard it. They said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, plural, meaning more than one. Now, don't mess with it too much. Uh, clarify that word as I begin the message tonight. And I'm going to go slow to begin with and get started. To clarify that word, devil, one, the King James Bible is the only new modern, or the, it's the only Bible on the market that does not have the word demon in it. The word demon is not used in the King James Bible. Now, there is a reason for that. King James Bible says devils. When a man is possessed, it doesn't say he's demon possessed. It said he's possessed of devils. And of course, as I said, there is a reason for it. Now, you and me, we think of demon possession. We think of uh, the movies like The Exorcist and uh, Rosemary's Baby. Uh, the Exorcist was a movie that grossed Ten million dollars. The first thirty days it was out on the market. That was that was probably fifteen years ago. And demon possessed possession in movies. I think now there's Exorcist two, Exorcist three, and on and on and on. And the normal thing for movies nowadays in Hollywood is for a creature to be living on the inside of somebody. And halfway through the movie, it starts busting out their chest, you know, and claws start coming out and eating kids and, and doing all kinds of crazy things and dogs' heads coming out of their mouth and pigs' faces appearing through their face and all this stuff is for a purpose and for a reason. Now, the word, as I said, the word demon is not in the King James Bible and there's a reason for it. The King James Bible is right. It is correct. Always. And it uses the correct terminology. Now the reason the word demon, I personally believe, in the, is not in your King James Bible. I looked up both those words, demon and devil. And if you look up, you will find that in, in uh, ancient times, and especially in Greek mythology, that a demon could be a good spirit or a bad spirit. So at the King James Bible, during those times, 1600s, 1700s, would have used the word demon. It may have not always been bad. It would have been determined by what that thing done, whether it is good or bad. So the King James uses the word devil. Evil. D with an evil on the end of it. And it's little devil. And there's no way in the world that could ever, ever, ever be good. So the new Bibles are more misleading than the King James Bible is. 
to when the Bible, the King James Bible said, they, they shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That is exactly what it's supposed to say. So don't change it and make it demon. Now we understand what we're talking about when we say demon, but God meant and did exactly what was right when He wrote this book, and that's why He uses the word devil and not the word demon. Now to begin the message tonight, as I said, in the last 25 years, this thing has become popular, it has become very rampant, and very accepted in society. There are a lot of religious people who don't want or lack the thought of believing in a demon, but the word devil, of course, means, uh, uh, that's where we get the word diablos. I think that's what it is in Spanish, right, Brother Richard? Spanish is diablos devil. Diabolical. See that? Diabolical. Uh, that's what the word devil means. It means wicked. It means evil. The word devil means something that's uh, uh, just as low and evil and wicked as you can possibly get. So tonight, I'd like to bring you a three-part message. And the first part I want to talk about is, are there really, is there really demon activity today? I don't want to get off on a demon kick. I don't want to look in every person's eyes that looks a little funny and say they are demon-possessed. But on the other hand, I'm not going to ignore the, thing, the way people are doing and acting and living today and attributing all of it to mental illness or some way they was raised or just some kind of paranoia or uh, destructive trends that they may have their personality either. There is, according to the Word of God, people who are, were, and are possessed of devils. I remember preaching at the trade lot one time, and there's a man come up to me, an old saint of God. I was preaching at the trade lot in Nashville. I was preaching on top of a van, I believe it was. And when I got done preaching, he come up to me and he said, Young man, he said, if God opened your eyes and you could see all the enemy that's around you here in this trade lot today, he said, you'd be scared silly and you would run and hide. And I got to thinking about that. And I thought about all the multiplied millions of demons that are out in the world tonight. And brother, they are all over the place. You think about it with me tonight. They are manifested very clearly on the foreign mission field. Let's think about demonic activity today. Number one, demonic activity today. Now, demons are smart. They do not manifest their self in the same parts of the world the same way. They're too smart for that. In other words, there's not, we don't usually see somebody up here kicking and gagging and, and spitting up and jerking around all over the floor with their eyes all glossed. You don't see that right here in our church. You know why? too smart. You go to the mission field, you do see that. Where there's an ignorance of the Word of God. Where there's a... Uh, you see, if that happened right here in our church, it would make more believers than, brother, the devil would want to happen. So he's very smart and he keeps that thing here. If everybody was demon possessed coming here tonight, the devil wouldn't win a victory. God would win a victory. Because everybody get right with God and get on fire for God. So the devil's smart. He knows where he can get by with it and where he can't get by with it. In Haiti, not too long ago, a country where their stomachs are swollen from lack of food, a country where the national religion is voodoo mixed with Catholicism, a country where children are starved. Some of them talk of kids eating lice off each other's heads and dying of diseases, a country who uh, is spiritually in the dark, having witch doctors and... and um, uh, things like that. When I was in Haiti, they told us, uh, Brother Paige Gibbs, who was with us on that trip, said that he had went to one of those services where they would take a chicken, they would wring its head off, they would drink the blood right out of the neck of the just-killed chicken, 
And then they would do some kind of dance and begin to chant words and just say, you know, and they, what they're doing, they're invoking a spirit. And they know those spirits by name, by the way. And they say, oh great, Qumran, you know, do this, do that, you know. And then all of a sudden, Something happens to them people and they just get like this and they can walk on hot coals. They can lay on beds of nails. And we eyewitness testimonies of people in America who have seen that with their very eyes. I tell you what, I don't care what you say tonight, you can't sock yourself up hard enough to walk on red hot coal. If a man walks on red coal barefooted, he's getting some help from somewhere. I'm telling you tonight, brother, that activity is there. They got a demon and a witch doctor down there. They took a machete. A man cut both his feet off. They lay on hot coals, beds of hills, sling steel balls. They have steel balls like this. They have huge, huge sharp spikes coming out of them steel ball. They'll take that steel ball. They, I think it was another preacher said he saw this happen. They'll sling it around like that. The steel ball goes, the steel goes into their back, lay that thing down and walk off and never feel any pain at all. In Columbia, South America, a woman asked a missionary to give a refuge to a 15 year old girl and they hired her to do the housework. When that girl came into that house, they said dishes and pots and pans and, and, and forks and knives would just go flying around the room. For no reason at all. It'd be like a wind blowing or something. And strange, heavy furniture would be moved. Priests came in at night and they disturbed her in the sleep. They, they would, uh, they would tickle her. They would pull her hair. They threw dirt on men. When, when men would come and talk to her, dirt would just grab up off the ground and sling right in their face. And stuff like that. You know all that stuff they show in them old demon movies like The Exorcist? Where The Exorcist, you know, a priest got this cross, you know, and he's throwing holy water. All of a sudden the cross gets bent and thrown back in his face. That stuff really happens. That's for real. And brother, by the way, you'd be surprised that the unusual things, supernatural things that took place while they was filming that movie, The Exorcist, and all kinds of crazy things happened there when it first came out. We are messing around with spirits and they are demons. They work differently here in America because they are more sly. Some cases that I mentioned are similar cases like that here in America, but mostly it's a little bit different. In Georgia, a pastor of a church preached was astonished. They, they, they didn't believe it because there was something like about a 16-year-old girl. She had been having severe nightmares since she was seven years old. At three o'clock in the morning, she would wake up. Uh, she said uh, uh, her, her bed would just be messed up. They would make up her bed and get messed up again. They'd make up her bed and get messed up again. At three o'clock in the morning, she'd wake up just terrified. Now, this is a preacher telling. This is not something you read in, in a, uh, a comic book or a Newsweek tabloid at the supermarket. This is a legitimate man of God. He said, at three o'clock in the morning, she would wake up. She could, she would be scared. They'd be worried. They had to make up her bed and it wouldn't make up. The covers would just all ball up by themselves. And they couldn't, they couldn't figure out what was going on. They said that they, they checked it out and they found out that that girl's granddaddy, who was a maniac, had died in that bed at three o'clock in the morning. And somehow or another, when those spirits, I had a man tell me, out of here last Sunday, right standing right here last Sunday morning. I'd forgot about it till, except once, till just then. He told me, he said, before I got saved, I know there's demons in me. He said, I know there was. He said, when I asked God to save me and come into my heart, he said, I felt him. He was like, at this party, he's a rock and roll singer. He said, but he had, uh, he'd got in touch with 
big name groups and people that played with Leonard Skinner and some of those groups like that, he said, when those demons went out of me, they went into two different people in the other room and they didn't know what happened. But he said, I know what happened. You say, what did happen, preacher? Somebody in the other room left the door open. And you can leave a door open in your life, young people. And the devil is looking to get inside you. And the best way in the world to get demon possessed is getting a passive state of mind. And the best way to get in a passive state of mind is through rhythm. See? That's why the music you listen to is so dangerous as a young person. It opens the doors of your very soul. I tell you what that man said. He said that girl, they got rid of that bed. They, I don't, I don't know if a demon can be in a bed. Personally, I don't, that don't sound right to me. But they got rid of it, cleaned all that stuff, stood out, pled the blood of Jesus, and everything all right after that. That happened in Georgia. I know of a family personally where a girl, this girl said she is demon possessed before she got saved. I stayed in their home when I was preaching in another state. Her husband would vouch for what I'm ready to tell you. Now, when, now, usually when people bring up demon stories, I'm like you. I'm kind of, well, well, I don't know. Because there's so many nuts and there's so many uh, glory seekers and there's, there's so many people that... Now, now, that's just what the devil wants. The devil wants to confuse the issue by having a bunch of nuts out here so we won't recognize the real thing when it happens. You know what she said? She said, Brother Danny, I know I was demon possessed before I got saved. And I said, yeah, well, okay. I kind of took it lightly. I said, how do you know? She said, she began to tell me things. And I said, did you ever mess around with the occult before you got saved? She said, yeah, I used to read tarot cards. And that's a major sign. When a kid grows up and they've got a grandmother that's a witch and things like that, and they fool with Ouija boards and read tarot cards and try to tell fortunes and stuff, that's a major reason for a child becoming possessed of the devil. And she said, I used to try to tell people's fortune with cars like that. And I said, you're kidding. And she said, after I got saved, they went out of me. But she said, come back in my room at night. And she said, at night, she said, I'd wake my husband up. And I said, is this true? And he said, yes, it's true. He said, you could smell them. And he said, it smelled like sulfur. You know what sulfur is? That's brimstone. You know, that's what it's in hell. And he said, he said, I never did see anything. I never did hear anything. He said, but when she'd wake me up in the middle of the night, she'd say, they're here! They're here! He said, I could smell that terrible, like rotten eggs in the room. And he said, one night they was down praying. She told me this out of her own mouth. She said, we was down praying. And she said, them demons come in the room. And the demon said, I'm going to get you. And she said, no, you're not going to get me. I plead the blood of Jesus. And she said, them demons said, plain as day. They said, all right, I'm going to get your kids. And her kids had been in the living room and they was watching TV and they would went to sleep and she got scared and fear came over her. She ran down the hallway of the mobile home they lived in and her kids were jerking around the floor just uncontrollably around in the living room floor. That happened less than 300 miles from right here. Jack Hudson who was a pastor of Northside Baptist Church in Charlotte. One of the greatest men of God ever been in North Carolina. Great preacher. Great church. Jack Hudson was not a wild-eyed fanatic or a fly-by-night evangelist trying to gain attention. Jack Hudson had a nationwide ministry. Great church in Charlotte. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. Many of you heard the tapes that Jack Hudson preached. He went home for church, I believe it was, on Sunday night. The telephone rang. He said as he picked up the telephone to answer it, there was a female voice on the other end. She said, hey, my name is so-and-so. You're the preacher I just got through listening to on the radio, right? He said, was? She told him certain such town, radio station. She said, I got your name. And off of this, she said, I called you. They said you're in Charlotte, North Carolina. She said, I need to talk to somebody. I need help. There again, she had had a background of the occult. Cards and cards, telling fortune, seances, Ouija board, that type of thing. 
Evidently the devil had found an open door into this young lady's life. That girl said, she began to talk to Jack, Jack Hudson. She said, I've got something in me. He said all of a sudden her voice would change. There'd be an old deep, like scratchy voice come out of her body. And the main thing that Jack Hudson said was, he said, you get on a, pl on a bus, we'll get you money, you get here to Charlotte and we'll deal with you. He, of course, got everybody in the church praying that they could possibly get. He said, folks, pray. I'm going to have to deal with that girl when she gets here. He had never had experience much in that area. And said the strangest thing happened. He said the entire time he talked to that girl, his watch stopped. And he said, I'm not talking about a nut. I'm not talking about one of these... Crazy preachers that go through and everybody, you know, and, and knocking herself out and, and stuff like that. I'm talking about a man of God that established one of the greatest churches in the state of North Carolina. Man. He said his wife, I believe it was, had bought him that watch for Christmas. It had never lost one second of time. It kept perfect time. But he said the whole time he spoke to that girl on the phone, that watch didn't move. He said the next time he talked to her, when she got in time, he talked to her 20 minutes. His watch lost 20 minutes. He said that's the most weird thing that every time he was in her presence or listened to her voice, his watch didn't run. You know, I saw that video. When that girl came in his office... I think we can still get that video. If y'all want to get it up here and watch it, we'll watch it. But I tell you what, man, it'll, it'll make you have nightmares. They put that girl in his office. They fixed the video camera up in the corner of that room. Him and I think, uh, he, he sat here in his desk. She sat across the table from him, sat on a couch like this. He began to ask her questions. He said, ma'am, you've ever done this, that? And they talked to her a little while. He said, do you want help? And she'd say yes. And then something would come out of her voice like, you can't help me. And he'd say, ma'am, do you want help? And she'd say, yes, I do want help. And then that demon would take over. And it's like a battle for her soul. And I saw Dr. Hudson, that old man of God, while people were laying out there on their face before God, pleading the blood of Jesus, he said, I, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood. Come out of her. And that girl began to jerk and passed out right on that couch. It took three times of that. And the demons told their names. She spoke their names as they come out. You say, Lord, have mercy, Brother Danny. You've done gone off the deep end. I'm telling you what the man said. Anybody that knows Dr. Jackson knows he don't make up stuff like that. Man, he's done gone on to be of the Lord now. You can get that video and see it. It's one of the most unbelievable things you've ever seen in your life. It's not a cheap imitation like they show on TV. It's the real thing. Finally, the girl got straightened out. She did get right with God. You teenagers, that's why we preach to you to stay away from rock concerts and places like that. That's where you get them things. And you, you think you're smart. You think I can handle it. It won't hurt me. There's a spirits out there all over there just waiting for a young person to come along. And you know, I begin to think about that. And I put my own thoughts together. And I thought, that clock's stopping. There's more to that than a man might think. And I remember they said when Charles Manson walked in the courtroom, when they tried him in California, they couldn't, the judge, the off, but the clock on the wall would quit running when Charles Manson got up to testify or said anything. Did you hear that? That's what they said. That's what the documentary said. And then I remember the plane going over the Devil's Triangle down there in Bermuda. And they went into this green haze. And almost every one of those planes that disappear over the Bermuda Triangle, they see a green haze. And they say, we're going in this green haze. They stayed in that thing for like, something like ten minutes. 
This is a major airline. It's documented. It's on record. And the people down, I think it was on one of the major airlines, they said, we've lost that plane. We've lost track of it. I don't know where it's at. And but they lost that thing for ten minutes while it was in that green haze. And when they landed, the pilot and everybody on the airplanes, watch, it lost ten minutes. And that green haze is what them ships and them planes be before they go down there somewhere because nobody ain't never found one of them that disappeared over that Bermuda Triangle. There's no signs of wreckage. There's no floating pieces of ships. They're gone, brother. Vanished. And they see UFOs coming up out of them things. People's always saying, just give you something to think about. People's always saying, well, I don't know where them UFOs are coming from. They're coming from Mars or Uranus. There's got to be somebody out there. What makes you think they're coming out there? Have you ever thought they might be coming from down there? You better, you better be careful about anything. They said, they said that when that plane went down, chased that UFO up there near Fort Knox several years ago, and that thing, they said the whole time they chased that thing, their clock stopped. I don't know. That's demon activities. Did you know there are people coming and joining churches just like this who are demon possessed and are sent there by groups just to cause trouble, to deceive the leaders of the church, to cause problems, to mess up people, to bust up the house of God? Deuteronomy, the Bible tells us in chapter 18, we're not supposed to mess around with divination. That's fortune telling. In Deuteronomy, the Bible tells us not to mess around with an observer of time. That's astrology. It's absolutely unscriptural for a Christian to get the morning newspaper to see what the stars hold for him today. Man, you ought to be a Christian ought to get their knee, down on their knees and open the Word of God and see what God has for him today. Amen? You say, well, I'm not going to go to work today because under my lucky... You forget that junk, brother. That's demonology. That ain't the Holy Ghost of God. Yeah, I, know, I know people that get a fortune cookie and they die to see what's in it. I don't even want to read them stupid things. <laughs> you know why? Because you see that thing, you think, old Chinese proverbs say, and you're liable to start thinking that stuff's true. That's, you know the way the devil gets you is make you believe in him. Now, I ain't never seen nothing. I ain't never seen nothing supernatural. Honest to God, I ain't never seen nothing. I'd like to see a UFO or something. I've, 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 I've tried my best to look up and see something. I've almost made it up to see something. But, I, but see, the devil knows how skeptical I am. He knows, boy, I'd use it on him if I seen something. Man, I'd preach it all over the country. But I tell you what, brother, listen, there's something out there, and I believe in it. I believe it's there. Now, listen, let's take just a second tonight, secondly, and give you a Bible description of demons, okay? Now, get your Bibles now, because this may be the only time somebody's ever heard a Bible description. This is a Bible description now of demons. I'll tell you one thing. There's a lot of rock singers that get on stage and they say, I didn't say it, they say they get possessed when they get on stage. There's one rock group named Possessed. There's many of them say, I go into a trance. I don't know where the words come from when I write a song. And you can look at album covers and you will see pictures of demons and they're not getting it out of the Bible neither. They're seeing something. They're seeing something. You ask anybody that's ever been on drugs real bad. And then how can roll? As a boy told me, he was he was a young man. Said he's called to preach. He said before he got saved, he used to take he take a gallon of gasoline and cut the top off a gallon of gasoline and stick his face down in it and just sniff it to get high. Hey, I'd give you Lord in mercy. Anybody do that's crazy. But that's what he done. He's on drugs one day. Said he's laying in the house listening to the tape player. And he said, all of a sudden, he heard a car drive up in the yard. Somebody come up, went, knocked on the door. He said he started up answering, and he said the tape player speakers, like it had a mouth, it said, don't answer the door. 
And he laid back down. He said, a minute. They knocked on the door again. The tape player spoke again. Don't answer the door. You say, you leave that? He didn't have no reason to lie. We went street preaching together. I don't believe he made it up. He said he had a pair of overalls that he wore all the time before he got saved. And his clip, you know, where they come around here and clip right here, snout was tore up. And he says out there one day and he's on, real bad on drugs and he's listening to music and stuff like that. And he said this real funny figure appeared to him and said, I'm going to give you a name. He said, your name is Strida. I ain't never heard that name before since. He said, I'm going to fix them things for you and reached over and touched that thing and fixed that clip. And he said, after he sobered up, he never forgot that and that thing never was tore up no more. I've had other people tell me, said, Danny, I've seen the devil. I've seen the devil. Now, you know, everybody like that ain't hallucinating people. They're seeing something. Now, let's look and see what, if you could see it. together or they're mighty little one. That's what Beelzebub means. It means Lord of Flies. A good picture of a demon would be a fly. They manifest itself a lot bigger than that, but they're winged creatures. And they're always pictured as having wings in the Bible. Not angels, demons. Look here in, in uh, Luke chapter number 8 and verse... Number 27. And when he went forth to the land, there met him of the city a certain man, which had devils, which were studying tonight as demons, long time. And I told you a minute ago why the King James Bible said devils and not demons. Because demons could be good in the old times, Greek mythology, and devils can never be good. So the new Bible should have devils in them, not demons. The doubt King James says devil. Now notice the man that's demon possessed. He wear no clothes. When a person loves to take their clothes off in public, it is a sign that demons are messing with them. A nudist colony is a picture of people that are possessed with demons. Amen? That's right. He wear no clothes. Neither a boat in any house. He just likes to travel around from one town to the other. You ever met him? By, you ever met any people that love to run around in old school buses and not take their clothes off all the time and not live in any certain place? You ever met anybody like that? These flower children, rain people, whatever they are. Look here. It said, but in the tombs hung around with the dead in. And they noticed what else it said. It said he, uh, over in another scripture, he, they bound him with chains and fetters. He broke the bands. He broke them all. Whatever how they tried him up, he'd break out. Didn't pay no attention to it. He broke all the rules. Look at verse 30. Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? He said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. Notice what the book Book said there, that man had many devils into him. Verse 33, when the Lord uh, rebuked them, the devils went out of the man, entered into the swine, 2,000 hogs feeding, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. So we notice, first of all, that they are, uh, many of them can get in a human being, and that they are winged creatures. They are winged creatures. Now, turn to Revelation chapter 18. Let's turn to a few more scriptures. The book of Revelation chapter number 18. Let's look at it just a few minutes tonight now. Get these things down pat. You'll know more than the people that make movies will know if you'll just get your Bible and follow along with me. Revelation chapter 18 and verse number 2. Here during the Great Tribulation, talking about that wicked, ungodly place called Babylon the Great. And he said in verse number 2, And he cried with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. See that? 
and of and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now God said that for a reason. He, was, he might have been referring to just old fowls of the air that fly around, but the fowls of the air and demons are pictured as pictures of each other. In other words, you birds. You, ever, you want to see what a picture of a demon would be? It'd be like sitting right here tonight, an owl. Now, you know what an owl looks like. Now, you picture an owl sitting right there tonight. And he's just like this. Per and you know how their head, or ever how they do. <laughs> Best I can do. I don't know how an owl looks. Maybe they don't blink their eyes. Is it owls that don't blink their They turn their head all the way around like that. That's what they do in them demon movies. Now, did you know if God, uh, an owl would be a picture of a demon? And did you know right now while I'm standing here preaching, they're flying around in here? You ever heard anybody say a little bird told me? Where'd that come from? Let me show you where it come from. Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Have you ever not even told a secret, but it got out anyway? How in the world did they find out? Ecclesiastes chapter 10 tells you. Verse 20. It tells you, you better watch what you say about people. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20. Curse not the king. You just got there? Let's go now. Ecclesiastes 10. I still hear pages. Right about the middle of your Bible there. Over past Psalms and Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20. Curse not the king. No, not in thy fault. And curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Mm. How'd you find that out? Oh, little bird told me. I wouldn't doubt it one bit. Wouldn't doubt it one bit. Now, let's go to uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 34. Flip over to you right there. The book of Isaiah, chapter number 34. And let's see what the Word of God said. You know what the book of Isaiah 34 is talking about? Talking about lake of fire in eternity. They're going to a lake of fire. Now, as you know, the book of Ezekiel, the book of uh, Isaiah, sometimes it'll speak to the Antichrist, but it'll be talking to a king, but referring to the Antichrist. Do you know in the book of Isaiah, in prophecy, it'll be speaking like to that plant, but be speaking to a person? Watch what it does. Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 10. In verse 9, it said they're going to have brimstone and burning, burning pitch. In verse 10, it shall not, excuse me, lake of fire, it shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever and ever. This is hell, people. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant, and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also, and the raven shall dwell in it. There's them old unclean, hateful birds in the lake of fire, living in it. And he shall stretch out upon the land of confusion as stones of emptiness. Now, do you know what a cormorant is? A cormorant is a bird that hangs around the sea, and it's one of these huge, long-legged, long-necked fowls, and you see them around the ocean, hang around the water, and their job is to catch fish. Jesus said, come after me, I'll make you fishers of men. And brother, the book said that cormorant will be in the lake of fire during the millennium. That scripture there is dealing with the millennial reign of Christ. And brother, the owl and the cormorant and the raven that pictures those demons will be in the lake of fire. 
So if you want a picture of a demon, it's them long-legged, long-necked birds that hang around the coast. Or it's an owl, or it's a raven. And that's why on the front of a rock and roll album, it's always got some kind of weird monster with great big wings flying down, and this really girl riding on its back, or something like that. They're getting it from somewhere. Now notice, secondly, about the Bible description, that they like warm, wet climates. Demons like to hang around where it's warm, and they like to hang around where it's wet. Did you know the, the, uh, the uh, uh, most wicked cities in the world are seaport cities? You say, well, Brother Danny, that's just because of the trade and all that stuff. No, it's not. People that don't even have anything to do with the trade like to go to these seaport cities. You know the most wicked places in the world? New York City, the Florida Keys, Miami, San Francisco, Los Angeles, St. Louis. New Orleans, uh, places over there in Tokyo or, or, and, or places like that that are on the coast or the water where demon activity flourishes, where it's warm, where it's wet, where they, they like to be around wet places. My picture of those birds, birds like to be around water and land. I'll tell you one, Myrtle Beach. Now, I like the coast, man. I like the ocean. I like the beach. I like the sand. I like... But you ain't nobody can sit here and tell me that demons ain't working 40 mile a minute in Myrtle Beach. I mean, if you can't figure that out, you ain't got no spiritual discernment. I used to go to the beach all the time before I got saved. And the, the time I went back after I got saved, it blew my mind. I said, man, this place has got wicked. <laughs> Did you feel like that first time? first time you went back... It wasn't. A, it didn't get that much wicked in one year. I picked up FM radio in my soul. See, when you get saved, it's just like you got AM. You can't pick up the FM stations. When you get saved, just like God puts another, a whole another sequence inside you, and you can start picking up on this stuff. So demons like to fly. They like to be around wet, warm climates. They like lakes and they like fire. Hence. The most popular thing is a fireplace and a, and a house on the beach. And that's why, listen, brother, when, when these kids get out of school, they go down there, they, they go hog wild crazy. Nothing wrong with the beach, nothing wrong with the water, nothing wrong. It's the low down people that makes the sin. Amen? That's why a Christian, a Christian cannot feel in place around a bunch of people screaming and using cane and drinking and living like the devil and taking the name of God in vain. There's nothing wrong with the water. There's nothing wrong with the sand. There's nothing wrong with the waves. There's nothing wrong with play. But brother, I'm telling you, there's demonic influence in places like that. You better be careful. You know them kids, when they get down that beach, they go hog wild crazy. They're away from mom and daddy. The beaches in California, Fort Lauderdale, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Tampa, Jacksonville. Now watch it. Matthew 17. Turn your Bible there. We're going to hurry along here and start getting down to the end. Matthew 17. Give you a little Bible on this. You know why they like warm, wet things? They're going to a lake one of these days, and it's a lake of fire. Matthew 17, verse 15. Matthew 17, 15. Look here what the book said. And when they were come to the multitude, they came to a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic. Now, there's an interesting word you don't hear much anymore. Lunatic. What does that sound like to you? What Luna? Lunar. The moon. You ever wonder how come the old timers thought that demon possession had something to do with the moon? Have you ever wondered why when you see an old horror movie that the werewolf turns into the werewolf on the full moon? I don't know if you believe this or not, but I've talked to people that work law enforcement in crazy houses, brother, that said the people go nuts on a full moon. Oh, I don't 
wrong with that, Brother Danny. That's just, it's a study that the gravitational pull, they ain't that much more gravitational pull on a full moon. And I want you to tell me something. What would, why would gra- gravitational pull make you want to stab somebody with a knife? Gravitational pull would help Michael Jordan. He... <laughs> He's probably needing it by right now. I don't know. But I want to tell you something, buddy. Gravitational pull ain't going to make people cut each other with knives and murder and steal and stuff like that. Notice what it said. Lunatic. You ever, the old people, when somebody's demon possessed, they said he was moonstruck. You ever thought about that? Well, look at here. He's lunatic. And sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire, warm, and oft into the water, wet. Well, let's look at let Matthew chapter 12. Back up there in chapter 12. Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 43. Let's nail it down right here. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43. Everybody got your Bible? I'm kind of high teaching, high preaching, and I, this is good for you to learn. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. See it? It says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. See that? He walketh through what? Dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. An unclean spirit can't find no rest in dry places. That's why he likes that human body. Warm and wet. Inside. Then he saith, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Now, I ain't got time to get into this, but here's a whole other big Bible study. People argue and people preach and people about demon possession, demon oppression, and demon obsession. Now, they're, they're, the first one is biblical. I know those other two. Those are nice phrases that men have, have made up. But let me just tell you this right now. The, the question comes up, is this a picture of a man who got saved and then, and then got demon-possessed? No, it is not. That's not the picture of a man that got saved and then got demon-possessed. You know how you know that? This demon went out of the man, he walked through dry places, couldn't find rest, and come back to his house and finds it empty. If the man had got saved, the house wouldn't be empty. The Lord Jesus Christ would be there. Now, a demon can get your body, he can get your hands, he can get your mind, but a demon cannot get your soul if you're saved by the grace of God. Thank God for that. Amen? You know why? Because it is never empty. Christian's soul ain't never empty. Now in 1 Corinthians 5, there's a man that give his self to the devil so much, they turned his body over to Satan. The devil to kill him. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. So the devil can destroy your body, but he can't touch your soul if Jesus is there. So, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. And then look here. Here's what happened to a man that gets the demons out of him, but don't get saved. He goeth and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. That man's seven times worse off than he was before the demon ever went out of him. If a man just gets the demons out of him and then don't get saved, he gets seven times worse. All right? Now, lastly, let me say tonight, but closing. Well, by the way, John 8 said, The Son abideth in the house forever. But Jesus Christ is in your house, buddy, in your heart. He's going to be there forever, and the devil will never find it empty. I'm glad in the middle of the night, if the devil comes and looks at me, he can't say, I'm going to move back in, old Danny. And my house ain't empty. Somebody lives in me. Last thing I'll say tonight in closing, the only sure protection. I know some of you are probably scared to death and you'll go home tonight and you'll, you'll, have, you'll have terrible dreams and, and your husband works a shift and about the time. Now, don't start that stuff now.
Don't call me at 12 o'clock saying, Danny, I'm scared. I had a lady call me one night. She said, Brother Dan, she said, I'm just scared. I'm just worried. I'm just... I said, now, what's the matter? She said, I thought I heard something outside. I said, well, is your doors locked? Something? She said, well, they're... I've locked all the doors. And I said, well, listen, did you know if you start hearing stuff outside that it's going to get worse and worse and worse? Hey, if you keep believing that something's liable to show up. That's right. You know what I do? Now, this has happened to me a time or two. This don't happen very often. But, buddy, sometimes you can go out in the yard at night and feel an evil presence around you. Has that ever happened to y'all? It don't happen to me too often, but you just think, you feel it just like something's looking at you. I reckon it probably is. But I'll tell you how to get rid of it. I'll tell you how to get rid of it. Ignore it. Ignore it. Don't say, oh, no. Oh, they're getting me. They're here. They will be there if you start that stuff. That's why it's good for us to laugh here and cut up a little bit at the end of this service. Get them out of here. They can't stand a happy Christian that don't like them. But don't, don't get paranoid, man. They'll be riding your shoulders if you let them. They will. Don't believe them. They're liars. You know what they'll do? They'll say, you're not saved. Lady come to, I think it's Brother Ed McAbee, they said, lady come to him one time, she said, Preacher, I've got a problem. He said, what's your problem, man? She said, the devil's just telling me I'm not saved all the time. He said, well, what's your problem? She said, I told you, I've got an awful problem. The devil is telling me that I'm saved. He said, well, what's your problem? She said, I told you my problem. My problem is the devil keeps telling me I'm not saved. He said, ma'am, what, what's your problem? She said, I have told you my problem. My problem is the devil told me I'm not saved. I'm not saved. And he said, ma'am, the Bible says the devil is a liar. <laughs> Amen. Now, if he's a liar and he's telling you you're not saved, what is your problem? Listen, if you wasn't saved, God the Holy Ghost wouldn't torment you with it like that. You hear these voices all the You're not saved. You're not saved. You're not saved. You're not saved. You ought to shout the roof off the house. God the Holy Ghost. If you wasn't saved, the Holy Ghost would be sweet and convict you and woo you and grow you. He wouldn't torment you with it. Lord, have mercy, man. That's the devil bothering you. And the reason he keeps telling you because you keep listening to him. The Bible said, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Next time the devil comes around and says, you're not safe. <laughs> I heard about this one little boy. They asked him, they said, what do you do, son, when the devil tells you that you're not saved? He said, I just hold it up. and I just hold my head up and say, devil, it ain't none of your business. That's right. I like what that one guy said. He said the devil kept telling me he wasn't saved. And about every night he'd lay down and the devil would say, You're not saved. You're not saved. One, well, you're not saved. And he was an Englishman or something. And he said, Finally, I just took the Bible and I opened it to John 3.16 and I held it up and said, Old devil, read it for yourself. <laughs> hey, Amen. Said, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the devil will run you crazy if you'll let him. Don't, don't. People say, well, the devil's been riding my back all week. You give him a saddle. Amen? Throw him off. I like what Mays Jackson said. He said the devil got in a car with him. He said, preacher at this and preacher at that. And you can't pay your bills and you ain't no good. And God's through with you and blah, 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 like that. He said he pulled over on the side of the road and stopped his car, threw the door open. and said, all right, devil, get out. He said, gas is too high for me to ride the devil around. He said, now you get out of my car and I don't want you in here no more. The Bible said, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. I believe if you want the only sure protection we've got from the devil, and I've done this. I can truthfully say as your pastor tonight in closing, I don't know for sure, for absolute positive, that I've ever had direct contact with demons. I believe, I believe on three or four occasions I have. I, that's my opinion. I don't know that. 
But I believe there's been two or three times, and one time I was talking to somebody, trying to witness to them, and another time, buddy, you could feel it. You could feel it. And I got so scared, the only thing I knew to do, I'd heard other preachers say, and I tried it, and it works. There's one thing the devil can't stand when you get down and start pleading the blood of Jesus. Don't say, ah, devil, get away from me. I mean, one of, was Martin Luther, one of them great preachers. Which one of them threw that ball of ink at him? He did. He was writing and writing. The devil kept running around. He got so mad he threw the ball of ink. And they said he had a big blotch on his wall where he threw it at the devil. That's how real he was, his presence was in that preacher's room. But the thing to do is say, God, cover me in your blood. Cover me in your blood. Rebuke any foul spirit. Hey, you can't handle them by yourself. Moses didn't even bring a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Some of these, some of these crazy preachers on radio, they scare me, some of the things they say. Well, if you see that devil, tell him I'm looking for him. I'm looking for him. <laughs> Son, he'll tear you limb from limb. I, I, we're not supposed to fear the devil tonight, but we're supposed to give him his due respect, brother. He's second in power to God. I never did to him. I look him stand right straight in there. I throw my head in there. I look him square in there. I don't know about singing that, brother. I don't know about that. I'd just soon leave him alone. I, I learn people say, well, praise God, that give a devil a black eye. I never did even like to hear somebody say that. I think we ought to believe what the book said and plead the blood over a situation like that. Amen? All right, let's stand by our heads for prayer. Y'all come on, get us a song. Now, I thank you for your patience tonight. It's been long, but I want to give you a Bible lesson. On the subject of demons. I'm not going to ask you what your problem is tonight, but perhaps maybe there's somebody here with doubt. There's somebody here that you say, well, Brother Danny, there's so crazy thoughts come into my head all the time, and I just think crazy, ridiculous, stupid things. And that's where you girls need you a good husband that's spiritual to straighten you out. That's right. That's right. That's what God wants you to have. A good husband, you know. Women are more susceptible to voices like that most time than women. Nothing personal. Men are stupid. They go in with their eyes open. The Bible said the woman was deceived. That's how the devil gets you, ladies, just talking to you, just talking to you, just talking to you. Talk, 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 talk. Best thing you do is just close your ears. And take what the book says. Father, do what ought to be done in every heart and life here tonight. Lord, we know we've got enemies here in this room tonight. Rebuke them, I pray. I plead the blood over this place and every single individual here tonight. There may be some young person dibble dabble down here tonight in these things much, much deeper than any of us realize. I know it was no accident that you had me preach this sermon tonight. There's somebody here that needs it. I pray that young person will take heed to the warning for their life and soul is destroyed. I pray God you'd move the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.